everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday evening service here at Temple Heights Baptist Church. We are so glad you're here and that we get to sing together and worship together. And if you are ready to sing, because we got some songs for you. Turn to hymn number 379. Hymn number 379. Take my life and let it be and let me hear you sing. Just, I'm just a new excitement that I've never really had before as far as 
getting out and running, but it's more of taking people to the throne. And so, take my life and let it be. And so that's a, a prayer that, uh, many ways, is what I'm praying along the route that I take. All right, let's turn to 559, now that you're all rested. 559. Yes? Take it back into the track and back into running and give it to the people. Yes, I get an opportunity to say good morning to many people and wish them a wonderful day. 559. Come, ye thankful people, come. Come, ye thankful people. Yeah. 
to share with us tonight. Here's our opportunity for us to do some counting. What comes to mind as far as a blessing? Salvation. Salvation. Yes, that is a huge blessing. Assurance. An opportunity to uh, lead a lady to Christ at the um, fall festival on Saturday. And another one, uh, mostly dealing with assurance and knowing that you're going to heaven when you die. You don't have to worry about doubt, uh, doubt about it. What a blessing that is. There's no burden hanging over your head, no wondering, no, no anything. God has already taken care of it. That is a big blessing. Others? I don't know about you, Rosa, but I am like swamped at work. All of a sudden, it's just work has just exploded out of proportions. I'm sure for you as well, huh? Others? No blessings? Well, it's a blessing that you're here tonight. <laughs> another day. Another day, another day. Christians on the headmaster's list. Great. Praise the Lord. You're doing a great job. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to families, visitors coming into the Fall Festival, and said, well, how did you hear about us? Well, one of them said, this lady at the shopping center gave me a flyer. <laughs> I said, well, does it have to be that lady right over there? Pointing to Teresa. She said, yeah. So, you never know. So, I don't know what shopping center she was at, but I don't know if it was very close here. But this it was a that's small. Wow. And another lady, a family, uh, said that she Googled uh, things to do on Saturday. And we came up and said, well, we're going to go to that. So what a, what a great event we had on Saturday. I learned a lot about different foods that I never knew about and different fruits. And, and uh, the ladies, they just went all in and uh, was able to share uh, their individual cultures with us, and so that was very, very exciting, and it went very well. We had a, we had a lot of movement of people through uh, through uh, the front of the property there with the, the tents, and uh, uh, Ruthie and Jerry uh, almost went out of food. 150 hot dogs was what she, they prepared for, and uh, they had, I think, what, 30 left over? 20, 30 left over? Which somehow made it to my house. <laughs> We had, uh, we can count a lot of blessings. 564, 564. Uh -huh. opportunity to gather together, Lord. We thank you for singing praises to you, Lord, and Lord, be able to uh, tell you thank you in song and be able to count our blessings, Lord, and Lord, as you carry us through all life struggles, Lord, and Lord, show us that you are Lord and God Almighty. Lord, we left that pastor around, Lord, and uh, Lord, we don't understand everything that's going on, but Lord, we know that a pastor is in the palm of your hand, and uh, Lord, you're allowing him to, to be in the hospital again, and Lord, may you... Uh, um, 
be with him, strengthen him, comfort him, be with the doctors, be with uh, Rosa, uh, Lord, be with uh, his health, where we may see dramatic improvements, Lord, and Lord, may be able to be with us uh, shortly, Lord, and Lord, just uh, praise you for this uh, this time together, Lord. Lord, may you be with the needs, be with the children as they're being ministered to, with Awana. Uh, Lord, be with those who are still on their way, Lord. Uh, Lord, may you fill me with the Holy Spirit and fill Brother Steve with the Holy Spirit as we uh, we bring a lesson tonight. And Lord, may it be from you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's do it up. All right, we're going to go continue on our lesson. Good thing I came up with a multi-phase lesson. Uh, talk about talk about the king, good kings of Judah, the good kings of Judah. All right, so the good kings of Judah. So just real quickly as a review. The northern and southern, the uh, Israel has been divided into the northern and southern kingdom. So the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, there are 20 kings that take, that occur in both uh, countries, both nations. But in Israel, the northern kingdom, where there are 20 evil kings. And the southern, uh, southern kingdom, there were eight good kings and 12 kings. Bad kings, one of those bad kings being an evil queen, uh, to be technical. Uh, so the question had, I had raised is what made them good? And what made them good? And the Bible for these particular eight kings uh, says that they did, they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. So what did they do? Is there something we can learn from these kings so that we can also uh, be good and be blessed? Because when uh, they were good... The Lord did mighty blessings on them. Now we know that these good kings were not perfect, and they made mistakes, and some of them did not make it through their whole uh, their whole tenure as king uh, in good standing and had fallen. So what caused them to fall? And a lot of things we can learn learn from that. So we've seen we've talked about Rehoboam. He was he's the son of Solomon, and he that's he's the first king at the beginning of the split. He had many wives himself, and he immediately went and followed. After false gods, and so that was evil. Same with his son. Uh, and Asa came around, uh, being being a good king. He reformed the nation, removed his grandmother from power due to her idolatry, and he commanded the nation to seek after the Lord. He was a praying king, and we see a lot of that. And God caused his land to be at rest, and the nation to prosper. I'm sure when you look at the news, you want to and you see uprisings and riots and different things going on. That's a nation not at rest. But when, the, when things are moving forward, and you can probably look over history and see some decades that there's, well, the land that was at rest, the nation was at rest, when the Lord is blessing in those period of times. But he did have some mistakes. Uh, he did not totally remove all the false worship from the nation, uh, and he made a treaty with a neighboring king, and in the end, he did not seek God's wisdom when he got sick. So uh, toward the end there, he had not fallen, fallen through. His, uh, his son Jehoshaphat, he was a good king also. He built up the defense of the nation. That seems to be a good theme to look at, putting defenses up around from evil. So that's something a, a good king shouldn't does, as well as a good father and good mother, putting up defenses around their home against falsehoods. He removed false worship. Uh, he sent teachers throughout the nation to teach the law. He was also a praying king. He led the nation in prayer, fasting, worship, and singing, we see. And he listened to uh, wisdom, he listened to rebuke. God honored him and brought prosperity to his kingdom. And the nations around him were at peace. So even the nations around him were at peace with him. He did make some mistakes, and the big mistake is going to cause four generations of problems. Because he married his son Jerome to, let's go to the next slide. He married his son Jerome to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel's daughter Athelia, and so they were kings in the, uh, he, in the northern kingdom, all of them evil, and as we've discussed, they have in Jezebel particularly evil, and to marry the daughter, that is just bad news, and so how important it is to marry your children to godly 
people, godly spouses. Um, the Bible talks about uh, not being unequally yoked. Well, this is a prime example of where that goes wrong. And so, Joseph, about being a good king, he married. Maybe he was thinking this will help out the kingdom. Let's join the two kingdoms together. We are Israel. All of us are Israelites. Let's join together through marriage. Well, that's not the wisest idea because Athelia was bad, bad. Um, from her parents who were bad, bad. <laughs> and so that affected Jerome. And of course, the wife, as some have mentioned, uh, the man may be the head of the home, but the wife is the neck. And so it turned turned him to evil. And so he chased after false gods, which then impacted his his son, so Jehoshaphat's grandson. And they um, he was eventually went over and helped uh, his cousin Jerome uh, in battle, and he was assassinated by this guy Jehu. And so both Jerome and Isaiah were assassinated. Uh, that started a whole new line. Jehu eliminated all the uh, royal uh, sons and daughters of Ahab, and Jehu started a new kingly line there in Israel. And so then here we have an assassination of Isaiah. From Isaiah, then Athaliah, the grandmother, decided to say, huh, I see an opportunity here. Uh, my grandson has been killed. I will take the throne. So she took the throne. So here we have this evil lady taking the throne, and we've talked about how, if you want to know how evil she was, she eliminated the entire line of David. Any, any descendant of David, she killed, except for one little baby, one-year-old Joash. And so... Joash was hidden away by uh, the priest and hid in, hid in the temple. And then seven years later, uh, the priest brought Joash out and presented, here is the rightful heir to the throne, and let him be your king. So at eight years old, Joash becomes king. Athelia hears all the, uh, the praise and uh, the atmosphere going on, and says, what's going on? Trees and trees, and she yells, and she is let out of the city, and she is assassinated. So there's a whole bunch of of uh, murder going on, trying to plot how each of these kings died. <laughs> and you can see here, assassinated, 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 assassinated. Uh, if I saw this, I don't even want to be anywhere near power. <laughs> Let me stay in my position <laughs> and not chase after power. And we also see that uh, the Lord do through, uh, if they were not assassinated, those who uh, disobeyed the Lord, they had some sort of awful disease. Jerome died of a bowel disease or colon cancer, a horrible way to die. Uh, also, when he got uh, foot disease, he did not call him upon the Lord, and so he died a pretty painful death himself. Uh, we're going to talk about Uzziah. He's going to die of leprosy. So, not not many ways to uh, fun ways to die here. Is there a fun way to die? I mean, that doesn't work. But. So we've got to got through Joash. Uh, Joash, he was a good king, and the reason why he was a good king is because he had a good mentor, the priest that raised him, uh, was uh, a really great mentor, godly mentor, and so Joash followed him. The problem was when the mentor died, he then went to evil. So having listening to wise counsel is extremely important. And uh, be careful when that counsel goes away that you can find other good godly counsel. counsel. This uh, Joash did not. He did not. And he listened to foolish counsel, which led to an untimely death. His son Amazah comes to power, who is considered a good king. Uh, but he did not apply his heart wholly to the Lord. Um, he also had, he had issues listening to godly counsel. He allowed for false worship, and eventually let pride get in the way. He suffered by assassination as a result. So I think I've got everyone up to speed, right? All right, let's turn to Uzziah. Let's, I mean, uh, we're going to talk about King Uzziah. He is a good king. And Uzziah, Uzziah. We might, you're familiar with him in Isaiah, where it talks about Isaiah. We're going to be familiar with this king. In Isaiah 6, 1, in the year of King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up, and his train filled with the temple. So that's where you're familiar with this name, Uzziah, because of Isaiah. 
2 Chronicles 26, 1. 2 Chronicles 26, 1. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. Amaziah. So after King Amaziah was assassinated, they made his son Uzziah king. He is called Amaziah in 2 Kings 14.21. I'm sure you're interested in that, but uh, you can see 2 Kings calls him a slightly different name than, than 2 Chronicles does. Uzziah means, my strength is Jehovah. My strength is a Jehovah, where Azariah means Jehovah has helped. Jehovah has helped. Great names, aren't they? Strength, my strength is Jehovah, or Jehovah has helped. So how old was he when he became king? Sixteen. Sixteen. That means the age of William becoming king. I could see that. William's a good, good, he has matured dramatically, and uh, he would be a good leader. So if Uzziah's like William, uh, we'd have no problem. Second Chronicles 26.3. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he, lived, and he reigned 50 and 2 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. How long did he serve as king? 52 years. 52 years. So I think when you see the length of a, uh, a king, uh, that, that tells a lot, serving a long time. But if some, some, one of these kings here died at one year of reign, <laughs> it didn't last too long. So King Uzziah served during the time of several prophets. So if you're familiar with Hosea, Isaiah, Amos, and Jonah, all those prophets served while Uzziah was king. They were contemporaries of Uzziah. During this time, uh, Jeroboam II, so let's go over here. So we have during, while well, Uzziah reigned, his counterparts in Israel were Jeroboam II, Zechariah, Shalom, Menhem, uh, Pekka, and Hoshea. So all these guys reigned during the time of Uzziah. So a lot of kings of Israel reigned, came and went, but Uzziah was still king. So we find, find seven kings reigned in Israel at the same time that Uzziah reigned in Judah. Everyone following? Slow me down if you need to. So we find Uzziah was a good king. How do we know? 2 Chronicles 26, 4 says, And he did that which was right to the sign of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. He did that which was right to the sight of the Lord. So what did he do to be a good king? What did he do to be a good king? So first of all, in verse 5, And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. So number one, we see he sought the Lord. He sought the Lord. Notice what we find here. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. In other words, as long as you seek the Lord, God will make you to prosper. All right? As simple as that. We find that he sought wise counsel. So we find here this man, Zechariah, gave him counsel. He had understanding in the visions of God. So seeking, seeking the Lord, seeking wise counsel, these have all made Uzziah a good king. Jumping to verse 6, we find, uh, it says, And he went forth and warred against the Philistines, and break down the wall of Gath, and the wall of Gavna, and the wall of Ashdod, and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. So he battled against evil. He battled against his enemies. So battling. We also see he was industrious. He built cities. He was building. He was doing something, right? He wasn't just sitting around on his throne doing nothing, getting himself in trouble. So idle hands are the devil's workshop. He was busy. He was busy. So he was fighting. He was protecting his country against uh, evil. And he was being, he was not idle. He was building cities. Second Kings 14, 22 says, He built Elath and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his father. So he built the city of Elath. 2 Chronicles 26, 9 says, Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the turning of the wall and fortified them. So these buildings, these towers, these walls, these gates, they were all defense, uh, related to defense. Verse 10, also he built towers in the desert and digged many wells. 
for he had much cattle, both in the low country and the plains, husbandmen also, and vine dressers in the mountains, and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. This guy apparently was very busy, very busy, so he, he was not idle. He was not idle. So he battled against Abel, he built cities, he built up his defenses. Second Chronicles 26, 11, Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men that went out to war by bands, according to the number of their account, by the hand of Jael, the scribe, and Messiah, the ruler, under the hand of Haniah, one of the king's captains. The whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600, and under their hand was an army, 300,000 and 7,500, that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host of shields and spears and helmets and habergons and bows and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones with all. And his, and his name spread far abroad for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Look at all these things that he did. Look at the arm size of, size of his army. Two, three hundred thousand, three hundred, uh, seven thousand, five hundred man strong, a mighty strong army. He, look at the, he was very uh, inventive. Uh, the Bible, King James Bible says he made, made in Jerusalem engines. Uh, this would be, we would call them catapults. Made catapults, put them on towers. So he's very, very uh, inventive. He made sure that his military had all the equipment they needed, shields and spears and helmets and bows and slings. Uh, so he was, he built up his defenses. We, um, last night our school had a, a, I guess a seminar, they called it a family chat. So they had the older kids and the parents come uh, and talk and uh, come to hear a, um, a speaker on what little eyes, how to protect little eyes, how to protect little eyes. So this, the speaker was going through, you know, social media issues and different things that you should be wary of, uh, the use of cell phones, kids using cell phones, how to protect little eyes. And so building up our defenses, building up our defenses. So always something new for us to learn. Um, some of the things that they were recommending, Lori went, she was, I'm just relaying what she she told me about the uh, guarding little eyes. So we're protecting eyes. Protecting like eyes. And uh, recommending that when a child is asking for a, a new game or an app, that you play it first for a week. They said to download it in their age level for a week so that you can see what pops up, what ads there are, what the game really is. And, the, they, and probably your audience, anyways. They said any. Any app that allows you to, to talk to a real person, a predator can be on. It can be a Bible app that's answering questions, but if there is a way for it to have live process, that a predator will be there, and that you have to be careful about it. They said there are um, routers, we need to look into this. I guess there's routers you can buy that protect from what comes into the home also. And this is something for you guys, I guess one of the most dangerous places is um, the devices should be in the bathroom, the bedroom, in the dark, and grandparents. I guess grandparents is just as dangerous as friends' house for when kids are online falling into things they shouldn't get because grandparents don't pay attention because they're indulgent. You know, they don't think about it. So it was a thing too to tell your grandparents, tell your parents to pay as close attention as you do, that kids know how to take advantage of that. And they also said you should, when you give your child a phone, that you should teach them how to use it. So I'm thinking the technology is changing so fast, they're going to be teaching us how to use it. Well, I don't think they meant <laughs> using it like that, but that you train them, this is what the phone is for, this is how it is, you know, bad pictures you don't do, just like you would with books. You know, that you teach them the same thing and don't just assume that they'll automatically know how to turn things off. And now, one thing that we didn't do that I wish, you know, hindsight, they don't suggest a smartphone until ninth grade or above. They say if you're younger than ninth grade that there are other phones that can allow you to text back and forth to your parents and allow you to do some online, 
that's different than just the the thing. And there are lots of good um, sites that you can go to 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 look at and stuff. Do you want me to say all that? Are you preaching? I'm <laughs> preaching. I'm teaching. Oh. I am. <laughs> so, Sorry. So what what this brings around is the things we can learn from Isaiah <laughs> is that he built up these defenses. He spent a lot of time with putting a uh, building walls and gates and arming his army against the enemy, right? And he was very industrious and uh, took up his time and he sought the Lord and he sought wise counsel. These are what things this, uh, to, did say, to do what was right from the side of the Lord. And that's yeah. what they stressed with the cell phone or with the online stuff, that you have to build your defenses, that you can't just assume a kid will never do what is wrong or see what is wrong, that you build the defenses, you put in your guards, obviously your, your protection to to block out things that you don't want it to be there and stuff. And right. So yeah, that's exactly what you were saying, that you Right, even though we think this in. nation is probably peaceful, you should probably, if, if they decide to turn on you and you were not prepared, it's too late for you to get your defenses up. And you always think, not my kid, my kid would never do that. All right, so this is what Isaiah, this is what we can learn from Isaiah, but what did God do because of this? Well, number one, we see that God made him to prosper. 2 Chronicles 26, 5 says, And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding the vision of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. So because the Lord, because Isaiah sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him, God blessed him. Uh, we just talked saying, encounter many blessings. Look at all the blessings someone gets when they seek the Lord, right? The second thing we see is that God provided Uzziah with military victory, 2 Chronicles 26, 7. And God helped him against the Philistines and against, uh, against the Ara Arabians that dwelt in Gerbal and the Mahunin, Mahunins. So God helped him against the Philistines. Even though he, God gave him the wisdom to build up the defenses, who's really in charge of who wins the battle or not? God is. So here we have God provide Uzziah with military victories. Neighboring nations gave gifts to Uzziah, 2 Chronicles 26, 8. And the Ammonites, this is what he is, uh, present day Jordan, gave gifts to Uzziah, and his name spread abroad even to the entering in of Egypt, and he strengthened himself exceedingly. So even his neighbors were now pouring blessings upon him uh, as, as he was king. When the proverb, there's a proverb that says, when you uh, seek the Lord, even your enemies will bless you. Right? So here is, not that the Amorites were enemies at this time, but the neighboring nations were providing gifts to him. Number four, four we see God caused Uzziah to have great fame. The verse we just read says, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. His fame his, and his name spread abroad, even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceeding, exceedingly. The Lord allowed Isaiah's fame to go across the land and outside of, of Judah to the neighboring nations. So, let me ask you this. The King Uzziah, God blessed him mightily. What mistakes do you see Uzziah making based on what you heard? What mistakes would someone make when they're winning victories and they're getting blessed and all kinds of good things are coming into you, he forgets about God. He forgets, he forgets, he forgets about God. He thinks he can take. Yeah. What, what do we call that? What term do we call that? Pride. Pride. He got pride got in the way of him. He allowed pride to take the better of him. Second Chronicles twenty six sixteen. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God, and went to the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Be careful, your heart is deceitful. <laughs> even as I, even though he sought the Lord, even though God blessed him, still pride got the better of him. We see that when he was strong, when he was blessed, when he was mighty, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God. How did he transgress against the Lord? Well, he went into the temple and burned incense. So all my biblical scholars, is that good or bad? It's bad. <laughs> it's bad. Who is allowed to burn incense in the temple? Priests. Priests. Priests are only, only allowed. And the high priest is the only one allowed to go into the Holy of Holies for that matter. 
but priests are only the only ones allowed in the temple. And here Uzziah goes into the temple. Second Chronicles 26, 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God, and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Uzziah the priest went in after him, and with him four score priests of the Lord that were valiant men, so eighty priests uh, of the Lord that were valiant, they were strong, and they withstood Uzziah the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trans trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord. So here Uzziah, you can picture this, he is just feeling all about himself, right? Pride, I'm going to go in, and I'm going to burn incense in the temple. But we see here what, what, what great uh, men that were around them, priests that were all, the teachers, the priests were all intact, doing what they should have been doing. Eighty priests went and confronted Uzziah, says, no, don't do that, this is not your place. You're not, a, you're only consecrated priests of the sons of Aaron, are allowed to burn incense. You need to leave. You are trespassing. You need to leave. Uh, this is not honoring to the Lord. So 80 men confronted the king and told him, no. No. Well, what do you think King Uzziah did? He did it anyways. Verse 19, Then Uzziah was wroth. Who likes to be told what to do? Especially when you're king. <laughs> and Uzziah was wroth and made a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from, the, from beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. Here he goes, I'm not listening to you, I, uh, I'm king, I can do whatever I want, I'm going to burn incense. So he prepares uh, the, the bowl with the coals to, put, to burn incense on the altar before he gets there. He breaks out in leprosy right there on the spot in the temple. Or outside the temple, maybe it's not, maybe that would be unclean, right? He would be outside the temple, so he couldn't go in. And the, the priests are there, the 80 priests see him just breaking out in leprosy right there on the spot. And they, they push him, you've got to get out of here. And even here we find that Uzziah, he also recognizes it. And he it says here, himself hasted also to go out, because he knew what the Lord had done. Look at all the blessings God had provided for Uzziah. And he makes this mistake. And now he's a leper. He's a leper. Verse 21, and Uzziah the king was a leper until the day of his death. And dwelt in, the, in a several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. <clears throat> and Jotham his son was king over the was o, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. So he was put in a different house. He was quarantined. Do we know that term? <laughs> he was isolated. He was quarantined. He was kept away from the separate. He could no longer do his job. So his son becomes regent. And does all the all the work of the king in judging the people of the land. Verse 22, now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, first and last, did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, write. So Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial, which belonged to the king, for they said, He is a leper. And Jotham his son reigned in his stead. Here we have this amazing king, Uzziah, right? Isaiah 6, 6, 1, in the year of King Uzziah, in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So not the day that Uzziah died, but in the year that Uzziah died, whether he's already died or about to die, Isaiah sees this wonderful vision. And, uh, and we see that in Isaiah chapter 6. But uh, this is when that occurred. And we find here Uzziah, as he's, he's dying, he's a leper. A leper, not a good situation. So did that happen at, at the 52nd year, or, or how? Right, 50 second, 52 so years. So for 52 years he was good, and then he... Oh, when did this happen? Well, I don't know how long he was a leper, oh. but the remainder of his life was a leper. Oh. So, yeah, excellent question. 
I guess we could do some math on that, how long Jotham, uh, we can look into how long Jotham reigned and then how old he was when he became king. Uh, but we can see how long, but we'll, we'll assume at the moment that uh, he reigned quite a bit. Um, he became a leper before he probably got a hold of him. That's a good question. Maybe we can figure that out. But look at all the wonderful blessings Uzziah had. And yet, he turned from the Lord. He went and wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to violate God's law and burn incense on the altar, which was not his place. And God struck him immediately with leprosy, and there he died as a leper. As a leper. Uh, our time is up. I have plenty more material. If I have the opportunity next week, we'll continue on with the son Jotham. See what he does. Jotham is going to be a good king. Um, and he takes over when his father has leprosy, and then he becomes king when, uh, when, he, uh, uh, when his father dies. Uh, 2 Chronicles 27.1 says he was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 16 years. Um, so I guess there could have been a good amount of years that uh, Jotham reigned before he became king. But the good, lot, a lot we can learn from Uzziah. All right, let's close in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for King Uzziah, Lord, and Lord, how you blessed him, and Lord, how he sought after you, and Lord, how you made him the prosper, Lord, and Lord, uh, we, we, we desire that um, we be careful when you provide us blessings, that we don't turn and we don't get pr too prideful enough to know where our blessings come from, Lord. Lord, uh, we thank you for the, the teaching that we can learn from Isaiah, but also the warning, Lord. Lord, may you be with those uh, that are here and those that are uh, on the Internet. May you bless them mighty, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we have the prayer sheet.